Thank you so much, Juan Miguel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. is is great. I I love what you folks are doing with QAC, and I'm I'm really honored. And yes, today I want to speak to you all about the emotional and financial costs of running hundred plus qubit computations. So Juan Miguel, you already um, shared a great introduction. So thank you for that. Very briefly, um, this is me. My background is in quantum information theory. I, I'm a physicist by education, but today I try to be an entrepreneur. And I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Entropic Labs. So we're based in Singapore. Our focus is optimization with and for quantum computers. I do invite you all to have a look at our website for a number of reasons to see what we're up to, but also to check out the open positions that we have. So it's good to do a little bit of proselytism in, in these occasions. All right, so I mentioned Singapore, right? Let me start with that. Our office is actually based downtown in Chinatown. If you've ever been in Singapore, you will know that Chinatown is right in the middle of the island. Uh, we are in Telokayo Street, which is a very iconic area of the city. If you have never been in Singapore, well, this is a picture I've taken a few weeks ago. Being on the equator, you can enjoy very often the most incredible sunsets. The colors are just spectacular. It's also always incredibly hot and humid, which I think makes for a big difference, um, especially with, with Toronto. Um, when Miguel mentioned CDL, the Creative Decision Lab, it was one of the most shocking things to do to leave from Singapore and land in Toronto in like December or January. It was like landing on a different planet. Good memories there. Let me also show you some of the faces of the Entropicans. So Entropicans in the wild. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a picture of all of us together because of the COVID restrictions. So these are like, you know, shots that we have taken here and there. I also found one when we went to visit Sanadu, the first office of Sanadu that was in an old warehouse in, in the center of Toronto. I remember they had, or you, you folks had, the smallest and hottest conference room I've ever experienced. And there was like six or seven of us, including Juan Miguel, um, and go, going from like minus 20 outside to plus 40 inside was, was great. Okay, enough about the introduction. Let me get into what I want to speak about tonight for me and maybe today or this morning for you. So the emotional and financial costs of running large computations. Why am I speaking about that? I guess the big question that, you know, if you've been in this field long enough, you might want to ask yourself is, what has actually changed in QC, quantum computing, since 2016? And I'm using the date 2016 because this is when IBM put the first uh, quantum chip on the cloud. And I, I still remember I was a postdoc at the time, and it completely changed the game because you go from being a theoretical physicist or theoretical scientist like myself to actually having a chance to test what you're, what you're doing, what you're working on, using a real quantum computer pretty much any time of the day for free. Uh, it was incredible. And the first device that IBM put up had five qubits. So the most obvious thing that has changed since then is that, well, the number of qubits keeps growing. This is not a comprehensive list. Uh, there's more. And I hope the Senado folks don't mind if I'm saying that they have eight mods, simply because... Uh, I could find the squeezing features of the device. So I, I kept eight, but I know there are more coming up. So not only the number of qubits keeps growing and keeps growing really, really quickly. In fact, we have already crossed the 100 qubits mark. But what is very important is that there have been quite a few experiments lately demonstrating what is known as quantum supremacy or at least claims of quantum supremacy, where a quantum computer can uh, solve a, in this case, mathematical task much faster than a supercomputer could. We don't really know where the line lies. We know it's somewhere between 32 and 53, closest to 53, um, of course. But there's a reason why I'm bringing this up. And that reason hopefully will be clear at the end of the talk. And this is really the emotional cost of running large scale computations. So before we jump to that, what I want to emphasize is that we as a company, but I believe everyone who's listening today, want to very quickly ramp up you know, our algorithms and start running computations on 100 or more qubits. Of course, 100 is a is again an emotional threshold, doesn't have any specific value per se, 
but is the is a goal that we have in the short term and is the goal that everybody really should have in the short term. How do we actually do that? How do we run 100 qubit computations? There's a lot of challenges. What I think is beautiful about this field is that we are discovering more and more challenges as we go, which is great because it's fun. But let me, let me focus on two uh, tonight. The first one is costs, the financial costs of running large scale computations. Well, as you might know, running quantum computations are in cheap. In fact, it's not cheap at all. And the other challenge I want to introduce you to is verification, the emotional one. Can we actually trust the output of a quantum computation? And you will see that this is actually more of a subtle question than it sounds uh, at first. But let me start with the cost part. So the financial cost of running computations. And this is a word that we called Quantum computing on a budget. I'm just presenting the results. I have not contributed to, to the execution of what you will see. In fact, this was done by uh, Nur Shahidi, uh, Pat Singanipa, and Yon Muro, who's our CTO. So Pat today is pursuing a PhD at University of Southern California, but she was with us uh, during this work, while Shahidi is, is with us. It's one of our quantum software developers. So it is a paper in preparation, quantum computing on a budget, a practical example of cost-related trade-offs, and I hope you can read more in the next few weeks or few months. Okay, so this is the idea. Running quantum computations is important, and of course it's fun, and most importantly, we can do it today. But budget is a significant factor. If you're a student, if you're a research group, if you're a small company, well, you want to be very careful with that, also because running quantum computations is way more expensive than running classical computations on the cloud. So we sit down and we said, okay, why don't we do a study on this? Let's, let's be very practical here. And the idea is to devise a quantum computing optimization experiment on a budget. As you remember, we work mostly on optimization. So this is our bread and butter. We picked a well-known and still hard problem, which is bin packing. And the statement of bin packing is as follows. You have some items that have a certain weight, and this is the instance that we used. We generated it randomly. You want to know what is the minimum number of bins once you fix the capacity that you need to basically put all the items in these bins without, um, without going uh, beyond the capacity of the bins. OK, it turns out that for this example specifically, once we fix a capacity, um, the the smallest number of bins that you need is four, which we found with simulated annealing, letting it run for a while. But if you use off-the-shelf optimizers, heuristics for bin packing, usually the result that you get is actually five. So optimal result is four, heuristic result is five. Let's see what you can do with a quantum computer. We also gave ourselves a budget to solve the problem. So imagine we are a company and our budget is $2,000. So you are the head of innovation, you want to use a quantum computer to find the solution to this specific instance of beam packing. Maybe you want to fill up a plane, or you want to know how many planes you need to fly all the stuff from Toronto to Singapore. Something very important to keep in mind is that if you go on AWS, you can rent for a month a pretty damn powerful computer with $2,000. In fact, with about $1,600, bucks, uh, you can get a large EC2 instance with 64 CPUs and 128 uh, gigabytes of memory. So that's what we are up against. We decided to use two QPUs for this problem, uh, the Ion Q11 qubit device and the Rigetti Aspen 932 qubit device. So these are our quantum computers for the day. OK, so what is the quantum algorithm? It's a variational quantum algorithm. It's based on, on the results from this paper, from this recent paper. It's quite nice. Um, so you can use, you can actually encode this problem with six qubits. Uh, of course, there's a trade-off going on here. We are trading off space and time, which means that in this case, we need more measurements, uh, but less qubits. It is okay because it's a small instance, so we can do it, but something to keep in mind if you were to try to tackle a larger problem statement. It has two layers uh, that look like this. You have um, poly Y rotations, they're all parameterized and CZs in between the layers, as you can see in the picture. We did the full training of the, of the uh, variational algorithm on the QPU using SPSA, which is a gradient-based optimizer. 
So SPSA needs two runs for each optimizer iteration, so a total of 200 quantum circuits. With, and we decided to use 1,000 shots per circuit. Don't get too lost in the details. I'm sharing them with you because this allows you to actually calculate before you run anything how much it's going to cost you. And with these specifications, sorry about that, it would cost you $2,000 on IonQ, a bit more, for a single problem run, so to run the 200 total quantum circuits, while it would cost you $130 on Rigetti Aspen 9. So considerably less, in fact, about 16 times less. Now, you know, this is when is you start to appreciate how important it is to work on a budget. Because the Aspen 9 is 32 qubits, but we only need six. So you, you know, if you stare at the, to, at the topology of the device long enough, you will immediately realize that what you can do is actually to run four of those computations at the same time by basically blocking it on different parts of the QPU. So something very important here, right? So now instead of only running 60 more computations with Rigetti, we can run 64 because we have four at each point in time running on the larger device. And that takes you to about $2,000. So a single run on, on IonQ, uh, 64 runs on Rigetti. Now that you have more runs with Rigetti, you can also decide what to do with that. Do we want to work on the optimization of the hyperparameters or what else? In this case, we decided to actually use 64 different seeds. So the, the initial parameters that you put on your variational circuits to initialize. And let's see what happened. These are the results. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so let me explain to you what you're actually looking at. As I said, we had 64 seeds with Rigetti and only one with IonQ. Because of the way we designed the experiment, uh, once the cost function on the left, on the y-axis, crosses 64, which has nothing to do with the 64 seeds, it just happens to be the, 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 the number, uh, then we are entering the space of feasible solutions for a problem. OK, first thing we did, use a simulator. This was the AWS bracket simulator. Uh, the blue dotted line, you should be able to see my cursor. Uh, as you can see with the simulator, we use only um, well, we use 64 seeds also for the simulator. It did not happen to go beyond the feasible solution space. OK, fine. Uh, certainly, that depends on the choice of seeds. Same as Rigetti. Funny enough, despite the fact that we were using 64 different seeds, uh, you can see that there wasn't much optimization going on here because the cost value was staying fairly flat. At the same time, though, and this was very interesting, Rigetti managed to find a better solution that IonQ did. Um, throughout the 64 runs. While, as you can see with IonQ, there was nice optimization going, even if there was only a single seed, and at the end managed to cross the feasible solution space. So that's nice. Let's recap what we have found. It turns out that actually the best solution that we get identified uses five bins. So this is not bad, uh, despite the fact that there wasn't much improvement on the cost function we still found a solution that is as good as what the heuristic methods would give you. Not as good as simulated annealing, which was four, but still good enough. And despite the fact that IonQ entered the feasible solution space at the end of the run, um, the best solution it found was with seven pins. OK, I mean, this is interesting, but I think the big question for you all who are listening now is really you know, you're going to have a budget moving on, moving forward. And you want to use, you, you want to basically solve hard problems as staying within the, your budget. If you're an expert or if you use machine learning techniques, you will know that it is really routine to perform hyperparameter optimization all the time. And you can do that because once you end, for example, an EC2 instance, well, the machine is yours for a month, right? So you can constantly look for the best parameters. But with the quantum computers, this is not the case just yet. You have a limited amount of money. And for example, with IonQ, you have one shot if you have $2,000 for this problem. So you pick one seed, you do your work, and whatever you find, you find. But with Rigetti, that you have more, then you have questions that you ask yourself. Do we want to try to use different seeds, as we did? Uh, we also did other experiments where we changed, for example, the resolution of the angles uh, to see things better. And it turns out that it actually improves things with Rigetti, but I'm not going to show it to you. Um, or you might want to change the the scheme, the, the final measurement scheme that you use and see if that changes anything. But the important point to keep in mind is that within a budget, there's not too much you can do. So it's really important to perform this kind of benchmarks early on to get, to get a good sense of the differences between the quantum hardware 
and what you are actually allowed to do, uh, given financial costs and constraints. All right, so this was the financial part of my talk. Let's move to the emotional one. As I mentioned, the problem here is that on this small instance of bin packing, sure, I will go back for a second, you can find a solution and all is good because it's a small instance. But keep in mind that we actually like quantum computers because we believe they can solve problems that classical computers cannot. So the big question is, if a quantum computer solves a problem that is intractable for a classical computer, how can we certify the outcome of the experiment? How do we know we're not just getting random noise from the machine since we cannot simulate it? This is a well-known problem in computer science. It's known as verifiability of QC. And the question was first posed by, I believe, Gottesman in 2005 or 2006, and then was picked up by Scott Aronson that in his blog, well, he, he basically offered a $25 prize to anyone who can answer either positively or neg negatively the question of verifiability. Does every quantum computing problem admit an interactive protocol where the verifier is a classical computer? So can you actually certify classically that the outcome of, of a quantum experiment is indeed correct? People, this, this was in 2017, seven, sorry, right? So it's quite a while ago, and as you can imagine, people have done a lot of great work in this, in this area. It's, it's an incredibly interesting field. Uh, you can look at this review by Alex Georgiou and, and Kapurnitis and Kashef is, is, is a great paper if you're interested. But let me just give you an example of a approach to verification. So people have shown that if you have a classical verifier with a limited access to quantum resources, namely the ability to prepare or to measure qubits, then you can actually build protocols that allow you to test the prover, so a quantum computer, by exchanging classical and quantum information. So here the verifier is not fully classical, but can still do can still test whether a quantum computer is working correctly or not. So before we continue, I also want to introduce another idea. And I'm sorry if I am maybe piling up on concepts a little bit on this talk, but as you might be appreciating I am not sharing any question. I'm not going to share any question, but I want to give you ideas, a lot of ideas, and hopefully some will stick. So before we go on, I want to introduce this idea, measurement-based quantum computing, uh, a beautiful paradigm of quantum computation. It comes from 2001, Rassendorf and Briegel, and it goes as follows. So you will certainly know the circuit model of quantum computation, input state, gates, measurements. It turns out that there is an equivalent model of quantum computing called MBQC, measurement-based quantum computing, where you start with a highly entangled state that we call the cluster state, which is made of plus states entangled by CZ gates. And what you can demonstrate is that if you prepare this big entangled state at the beginning, and then you measure the qubits one by one in a specific order, so you measure in the XY plane, and you correct for the outcomes of the measurements. So there is a procedure to do that. But the beautiful thing is that pr this procedure is actually deterministic. So you can map the circuit onto a sequence of measurements on a cluster state. Then you can show that the two models are exactly equivalent. So either you start with an input state and you evolve it in time by performing gates on it, or you prepare a big entangled state and you perform the quantum computation by measuring each qubit one by one. And what you get at the end is sampling from the same distribution that you would have at the end of your gate, if you choose the angle, of course, correctly. So why am I saying this? I'm saying that because a beautiful model for verification of quantum computing, known as VUBC, Verifiable Universal Blind Quantum Computing, which was introduced by Anne Broadband, Geoffrey Simon, and Ellen Kashefi in 2009, allows you to do the following. Remember the picture I just showed you. If a client can prepare qubits and send these qubits through a quantum channel to the server, so imagine the server is one of our quantum cloud providers today, then the client can instruct the server on how to prepare the cluster state and what measurements to perform on the state. And it turns out that if you do it correctly, if you follow the rules, then the server will not know anything about what they're doing for you. This is the blind part. This is the blindness, which is beautiful. 
you can actually guide a server, a quantum server, to do a computation for you without revealing anything about the computation. But most importantly, you can also position traps on your cluster state. And if the server is not following your instructions correctly, then it will trigger these traps without knowing where the traps are. And you as a client will know that they are not doing what you're telling them to do. So this is the verifiable part. And it's universal because you can perform any quantum computation with this model. And this is such a beautiful result that Scott Aronson was so impressed. It couldn't give the full $25 price because the client is not entirely classical, needs to prepare qubits and send them over. But together with Seth Lloyd, who contributed with $5, they gave $15. So quite a big chunk of the price to the three authors. And I believe they signed each note and scribbled some complexity relationship on it. Uh, so this is a nice little story from the world of computer science. OK, so you might be thinking, why is he talking about all this stuff? Well, because this is really important, right? Uh, the emotional costs of running large scale quantum computations is that we don't know if what we are getting is noise or a good result. And especially if we are spending a lot of money for it, better the result be good and be accurate. But you can also appreciate that running something like this is very complex. And in fact, most of all verifiable schemes, sorry, all schemes for verification of quantum computing are very resource intensive. So a question we asked ourselves a few years ago was, can we actually do something simpler? Um, yeah, you can. And you can, why? Because today we have access to quantum computers. And when you have access to quantum computers, even if they're noisy, you can do pretty cool things. So this is the, the idea here. We get access to different devices, superconducting, NMR, uh, photonics, and trapped ions, and we use them to cross-check each other. It's not really a verification scheme in the purest sense, because you are verifying whether the device is working correctly. You're not really verifying the computation, but what is nice is that you can actually do it today. It's built on the framework of MBQC, of measurement-based quantum computing, and this is why I introduced the idea just now. It's agnostic to the hardware. So you can use it on all the beautiful devices that exist today. It's sensitive to systematic errors. You can apply it to any digital quantum computation, and hopefully it's useful. So you test it on a number of machines, uh, IBM, Rigetti, superconducting chips, and NMR in Oxford, Vienna photonics, uh, photonics chips, Philip Walters Group, and Innsbruck, the Innsbruck AQT ion trap. And you can see the number of qubits that, that they all support here. OK, so what actually happens here? What happens is that, and I will just speak, I will just guide you through it by, by talking. There's not going to be a slide for that because I didn't want to make it too heavy. It happens that MBQC is such a beautiful framework, unfortunately, a bit overlooked in, in today's world of quantum computing. And in this case, what, what it allows you to do is to demonstrate that there are certain computations on different number of qubits that are correlated in their outputs. Why? Because if you fix the MBQC pattern, let me go back for a second, if you fix a class state and the order of measurements on this class state, then you can change the way that the information flows on the state by basically assigning different inputs and outputs. If this is a little complex, don't worry too much. What you should keep in mind here is that you can demonstrate that computations on different number of qubits, if designed correctly, following this MBQC procedure, have outcome strings, or the probability of obtaining a certain outcome string, that are correlated. So for example, on a two qubit computation, the probability of obtaining 0, 0 is correlated to the probability of obtaining 0, 0, 0 on a three qubit computation. And if you know one, you can compute the other one. And this is the idea of this cross-check technique. For example, you run the two qubit computation or your NMR device, you get the probability of obtaining 0, 0, then you run the three qubit computation on the photonic chips, and you get your probability of obtaining 0, 0, 0. And since they are correlated, well, you see if by normalizing them, you get the same number or not. If you do, great, devices are working correctly. If you don't, something wrong is going on. So let me share some results with you. Uh, we came up with, a dist with, with basically a metric that measures how well the different devices are working 
Don't worry about the details of the of the matrix. I'll give you the reference at the end if you want to read about it. But what we found is that when you compare two qubit computations on these devices and six qubit on the Vienna machine versus three qubits on IBM Rigetti and six qubit again on Vienna, you get these numbers. So what do these numbers mean? Closer to zero is good. So qualitatively, you can see that the Oxford device is actually working quite well. When you compare the outcomes to the IBM and to the Rigetti and to the Vienna uh, machines, you see that they are constantly closer to zero than, for example, the Rigetti devices. And if you do a, a more comprehensive analysis by basically comparing the performances against all computations across all devices, you can see that the Oxford machine is the one behaving better, which is not surprising because this is an NMR device with two qubits. They have an incredible control um, on the quantum system at that scale, while the Rigetti one, which was the largest device, is more noisy than the others. So this is a qualitative um, statement, if you like, that already gives you a lot of insights about whether the machines are working as they should or not. I'll show you another graph, and this is really the last one before I come to, to a conclusion. Here we have the correlations plot. So if you remember, I said that certain probabilities of certain strings are correlated between the devices. Here we plotted them all together. And you can see the, the, pair, the device pairs, so Vienna versus Oxford and so forth. If everything were to work perfectly, as it should, when you normalize um, the, the probabilities, everything should be on the, uh, on the m equals 0 0.5 uh, line, because they should be exactly the same. But when you see variations, it means that one of the devices is actually suffering from systematic errors. And in fact, if the slope tends toward the horizontal axis, it means that the device on the vertical axis is suffering from systematic errors because it will have um, probability, prob uh, probability outcomes closer to the uniformly random distribution. So it will push the line down and vice versa. If the device on the horizontal line is suffering from systematic errors, will push the line towards the vertical axis. So you can see here that Oxford is behaving better than IBM, qualitatively, and so forth, and so forth. And I'm just sharing this result with you to, first of all, to convince you that you can actually use different quantum computers that are available today to cross-check one against the other. And that gives you a lot of insights. There's more that you can learn from these graphs. I don't really want to go into the details. But you can also see that some devices uh, consistently behave less better than others. There is also confirmation that the method actually works quite nicely. So the last comment I will make here, and this is the reference if you would like to have a look at all the details. So why am I showing you the full list of authors? Well, because as far as I know, this is the, I'll say the only paper, maybe it's not, but as far as I know, this is at the very least a paper where there is a large number of quantum company CEOs uh, for to be precise. So Chiara, myself, um, Thomas, and Joe, we all moved from academia to, let's say, the industry. And I think there's a sign also of how the times are changing. It's, in fact, a positive sign, I believe. And it's kind of nice to see it reflected in what I believe is a nice paper, where you have a strong collaboration between industry and, and academia. OK, let's wrap it up so we can have a chat with one Miguel. So what is the outlook here and what are the costs, financial costs and emotional costs? Is that as larger quantum computers become available, we are very quickly reaching a point where simulating the outcomes becomes impossible. This is absolutely exciting. This is the whole point of quantum computing, but it's also a problem. Because what do we do if we're spending a lot of money and we actually are feeling very anxious and very stressed because we don't know if we can trust the outcomes of the computations? So there's a lot of work that, that we need to do moving forward. Uh, verification, benchmarking, prototyping the algorithms, what I was saying before, how do we tune the FI parameters and optimize the budget that we have. And one comment that I didn't make here is that this method actually, it doesn't scale great. You still need quite a lot of measurements eventually if you want to find the full correlation plot for the outcomes. But the good news is that it scales better than uh, than the naive classical simulation method. And in fact, we believe that it is possible to push it potentially 200 qubits, like 
even with under qubits, you could semi-efficiently still test uh, devices against each other, which is nice because it gets us closer to this goal of running computations at a scale that is not classically simulable anymore. And let me conclude by saying something actually by, by really destroying a quote from the Karamazov brothers, the novel of Dostoevsky. And my new quote is, but what will become of QC then? Without error correction and full tolerance, all things are permitted then. And this is really the spirit. I mean, this is a hackathon, right? This is a carnival of quantum computing. I think what we can learn from, from everything that you will be hearing in these days is that we have the devices. We don't really know what to do with these machines. And we know that there's so many problems. Fine, but let's have fun. Let's try things out. And remember that everything is permitted for now. So let's push the boundaries on what is possible. Have some fun with QOA. Enter the QA challenge at QHack. Do a great job. Win an internship with us in Singapore. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tommaso. That was a really, really great talk. I certainly learned um, a few things. In, in particular, you, you now have implanted this idea of budget optimization for <laughs> optimization. Right. Of course, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's something that has to be considered as well, but it hadn't quite stuck to me uh, that clearly. Um, thanks for the fantastic talk. Um, I'm just going to ask you some questions first, uh, and then we'll get some also from the audience. Tommaso, uh, this talk was all uh, largely about optimization, right? And it was even meta-optimization, have to optimize, how to optimize, uh, how, right? Um, and it's, to my understanding, a big focus of Entropica. I was wondering if you could tell yes. us why, why of all the different areas that you could be specializing in, why is optimization kind of that main vertical for the company? Yeah, this, this is a great question um, for a number of reasons. So let's start with the most obvious one. Uh, there is, well, I would say there is good evidence, or at least we believe that optimization as a, as a field, as a whole, will benefit greatly from quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Even in the most naive approach, so in the most naive thought to that sentence, uh, if you think about Grover, uh, you know that you can use Grover to get a quadratic speed up for for optimization problems, so that's nice. But then the big question, of course, is can we do more or can we do things differently? How are the heuristics, like the one that we were just discussing now, going to help, if anything, uh, in the short term, think about problems in uh, in optimization? Another great thing about optimization is that is a it includes a class of problems that are applied pretty much in every field of the hum of human endeavors. That's true. That's, that's if, if you just think about it from a, from a financial perspective, from a market opportunity is really, really massive. And, and I also believe it's fair to say that optimization for a number of reasons does not enjoy as much attention, as much maybe interest as, for example, machine learning does. So we still, there are a lot of heuristics, of course, we still have a lot of heuristics, but as a class of problems, they're intrinsically really hard. They're intrinsically, or they can be incredibly valuable. And we believe that there is a big opportunity for a company like Entropica to really carefully and deeply understand how quantum computers can help. And on a more yeah. philosophical level, it also feels like it's a great way to understand what you can actually do practically with quantum computers. And even if the end goal is not going to be optimization, but if we can understand how to deploy quantum computations at large scale, even yeah. just on 100 qubits, that is going to guide us forward, uh, hopefully faster. I agree. I, I love hearing you say uh, um, that it's important to deeply understand, right? There, there's still so much that needs to be better understood and it's part of all of our roles that we can play is precisely to build an understanding and if, and if you do understand then you can construct things on top of that right it's always an exactly. important foundation thank you so much um tomas i also really enjoyed uh, and it's something that i think it's becoming more and more understood right that it's now possible for people working in quantum computing to be either in academia or industry there are options right yes. and, and you and you mentioned in uh, as part of this great collaboration uh, a great example of that right uh, scientists from from multiple uh, industries and universities working together for a common goal, 
Uh, and this is something that I get asked a lot about. What's it like working in industry compared to academia? But in your case, it's a bit different, right? Because you're not just a scientist that got a job in industry. You actually started a company, right? You're, I, I would say you're an entrepreneur as well. So I was hoping you could tell us a bit more about that road, right? So from the beginning, what made you kind of decide to start your own company? And, and what has it been like to get to, to where you are now? <laughs> Share some of the road with us. Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I also get that question a lot. It's a, it's well, a nice question. It's a very yeah. nice question. So let me try to let me try to address that and make it make it a bit more personal. So yes, indeed, I I was a postdoc here in Singapore at, at NUS at the Center for Quantum Technologies and at SUPD. Yep. and I was working, in fact, with with Joe Fitzsimon. I, I mentioned mm -hmm. his work a few times in the in the talk, and I sometimes blame him partially in a nice way for my current mm. role and position and, and life experiences because I think he, he played a major role in my thinking in the following sense. He mm -hmm. was always, even as a researcher, as a, as a PI, as a principal investigator, he was focusing a lot on the applications of quantum computing, but not on generic, vague applications, you know, in 100 years, we can do this, we can do that. Like, mm. what can you actually do with these machines that is non-trivial, that is valuable, and that is doable in the shortish term. Yeah. And when, uh, you, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I was mentioning that 2016 moment when IBM put the machine on the cloud and, and all of that. I think even as an individual, since I really love the field, and I can be honest with you, I don't think I'm the best scientist or researcher out there. The by, second by best. Any, second uh, best. Right. <laughs> your, your scale is widely broken there. <laughs> Just making you laugh, Tommaso. Keep going, keep going. Thanks. But I, okay, I was saying I don't think I'm the best scientist and I'm totally okay with that, but I love the field and I want to contribute mm -hmm. to it as much as I can. So yeah. looking at all the transformational events that were happening, the fact that the machines are available, the fact that there's more and more interest in, in the industry at the commercial level, I really wanted to continue playing a role. And I, I thought together with Yuan, who's our CTO, that mm -hmm. a great way to do that was actually to use our expertise that especially at the time was still quite rare. Um, and especially, let me say, in Southeast Asia at the time was, was maybe even more rare than it yeah. could be in North America. Mm -hmm. So to use that experience and that expertise to take or to start taking this technology outside of, of the academic halls and do something practical and fun and useful with it. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, Tommaso, I also hear that you enjoy cooking a lot, right? I do. My, my time in Singapore was very influential uh, with food. It's, it's, it's hard to separate Singapore culture from food, That's right? But I want to yeah. ask you an important question. What, is your th what are your thoughts on pineapple on pizza? Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> it was a joke, but you can answer as well. <laughs> uh, do you want me? I, I, I'm not. Uh, up, to you, up to you. Up to you. Up to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what can I say? I think think it's fair to be respectful of people's choices, even when you deeply disagree with those. All right. <laughs> That's the best thing. Amazing. Say. Uh, actually, more, more seriously. Um, Tommaso, I, I love Italian food and it's my go-to for cooking. I love the, like, the focus on flavors and quality of ingredients, right? Um, so, so I know it's part of uh, Italian culture as well, like the connection with food. Uh, I think it's true for almost every culture, but some of them, yeah, that's even so. stronger, right? Yeah. How has living in Singapore influenced kind of your perspective on, uh, on food and cooking? Oh. Oh, this is a nice one. You yeah. also you also lived in Singapore, right? And yeah. for people who have never been in Singapore, as as Juan Miguel was saying, it's very very hard to decouple being Singaporean or being in Singapore for long enough with from food. Like food is yeah. plays such a huge role, and That's Singapore right. is a is a melting pot of of cultures of of people. So you can get all cuisines, especially all uh, south south sorry Southeast Asian or Asian cuisines in this very small island, which is incredible. Like just today for lunch with the team, we went to the Hawker Center, which is one of the local eateries on the island. And you have rows yeah. and rows of stalls so you can get North Indian, South Indian, um, vegetarian, Buddhist vegetarian, you know, Chinese from all parts of China. And this is quite, it's quite amazing. Also because some of these cuisines are starting to get lost outside of Singapore. 
which is also quite interesting. Mm. So how has that changed my relationship with food, with Italian food? Well, yeah. as, as everything, right? When you experience, when you live different experiences, you ideally, hopefully, your mind opens up a little bit. I and agree. you start to understand yes. that there are different ways you can approach anything, in this case, food. As you said, Italians love to focus on simplicity and the quality of the ingredients. Yeah. Which is, of course, very nice and something very close to my heart. Yes. Uh, by the way, uh, a feature of Japanese cuisine as well, for correct. instance. Yes. Which maybe takes in, it in a different way, but you're correct. In a different yeah, I agree way. with that. Yes. Yeah, in a different way. Yeah. In a different way. The flavors are different. Uh, but, but Yeah, the but local I, ingredients are different, right? The local ingredients well. are different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's also a focus on like sour flavors, you know, this very pungent, aromatic mm -hmm. taste like soy sauce and so forth. But then you have, for example, Indian food, uh, where where the approach is quite different, right? There is a focus on the combination of flavors. How can right. you pack a lot of flavor into a single dish and bring them all together? You want them to sing in harmony, which is incredibly hard to do. So appreciating these differences and the different approaches is, well, yeah. personally, is a lot of fun because it's just so nice. You can go, you can buy all the spices, you can try, you can experiment, you can fail. And, you know, if you try long enough, eventually it tastes nice. That's right. I, I, for me, it's a, it, it's a symbol of many things, right? And even even in science, um, and, and I think quantum computing is specific in particular in that regard, that it's actually a combination of fields as well, mm. right? We all have to navigate, having to know a little bit about the physics, a little bit about the computer science, a bit about the math. So, so being successful often uh, involves at least some degree of opening your mind to new ideas and combine them together to make um, new results, right? And I think that also shows up in your work. So I was setting you up for that. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. This is this is beautiful. Right? I think this is one of the beautiful things about quantum computing is in a way you're also saying. So I, I expect there's all sort of people listening to us right now. Yeah. You, you might have high school students, you might have physicists, chemists, whatever, right? Or people who are simply interested. And yep. it's rare. There are not too many fields out there or too many areas of science or research where you get very very wide audiences. And, and what I also love is that people are really willing to chip in. They're not just here to listen and then they go home and say, oh, that was nice, but forget about it the day after. Like they're actually here to do mm -hmm. things, to try. And, and it's great. I mean, it reminds me so much of, of computing as a whole, right? What happened 50 years ago when people were trying, they were hacking their way through it. And today we are back at it. And I'm just very grateful that we can really? play a small part. Excellent. Tommaso, let's maybe move to some of the questions from the sure. audience. Um, so there's one question uh, asking, so you mentioned that uh, measurement-based quantum computing and some of the ideas behind it are maybe not as popular as they, they could be. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why do you think that's the case? Oh, nice one. I think it's because the circuit model is, so, so I, maybe another way to answer the question is, or, or to say is what is the popular model? Well, it's the circuit model, right? So why is mm -hmm. the circuit model model very popular? Is because it mimics the more traditional classical computing model. You have an input, you have some gates, and the computation moves in time from left to right. The information keeps on being processed at each yeah. step. And it's very intuitive to understand the process like that. Measurement-based quantum computing is a bit tricky because because it's not so intuitive. It doesn't really have a parallel. In, in fact, it doesn't have a parallel in classical computing. So you can just intuitively understand what is going on. But what is beautiful about class, about MBQC is mm -hmm. that you can more intuitively understand the separation between the classical and the quantum part of the computation. Interesting. I, I, I won't get into the details of that. Mm -hmm. but it is one of the great features of MBQC. Um, so I, I love the model and mm -hmm. I was very happy I could bring it up today. So maybe people will go and have a look and, and learn something about it. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate it. All right, Tomas, maybe one uh, last question. This is a question from Abhisheku Manitoba. And it says, given the very high cost and times of running circuits on actual quantum hardware, right, which is a topic of your mm -hmm. talk, how can we train models? They're talking about machine learning models, but I would say models in general, which require a very large number of iterations and costs. So yeah, this, if, if it's already expensive, what can we say about this scaling up even more? Right. That, there's a huge, I mean, Abhishek, there's a great question. I mean, this is exactly what we are asking ourselves, right? Um, if, you, if you're looking at a small number of qubits, let's say 15, 20, 30 qubits, then of course you can do that with a simulator. 
Well, maybe I shouldn't say, of course, it, it might mm. not be so, so obvious, but you could do it with a simulator, right? So you simulate the quantum computation and you do the training on the on the simulator, on a classical computer. If it's 2030, you will be able to do it on your laptop. And then you check if things are working fine or not. If you want to do it on 100 qubits and you want to do the training on the QPU, well, that is a problem. That is a great problem to have. And is yeah. it doesn't have an obvious easy answer. So I'm sorry for that. But this is why, I mean, groups like ours or companies like ours and other people are very actively trying to understand if there are smart ways to use, for example, classical computers to help with the training so that you don't have to spend too much time doing the training on a QPU. Yep. Yeah, so I always like to think that the fundamental problem to face with quantum computing is a problem of scaling. It's both yes. from the hardware perspective, but also yeah. when it comes to the application and what we want to do with the devices, it's about reaching an, uh, a different scale of application. So that, that's really the heart of the matter, right? And, and this question and also the content of your talk, I think, is addressing it. Tomas, maybe one last question. I believe it's from S871, which was maybe part of the beginning of your talk. Um, where basically the question is, is trying to, to tell us, surely having more qubits and more complicated operations is actually going to help and lead to mm. lower errors, better results. Um, do you agree with that statement? Or would you comment about some trade-offs that come also with the, the scale of the capabilities that you have? The, well, the, the more qubits always help you out. The more gates the more always help you. more qubits always help you out. Um... Eventually, yes. Well, with a big caveat, it depends on the error rates. So eventually, yes, if we can contain the errors. Because the more, mm. like once we will have, oh, okay, actually, let me add to that. I'm sorry. Yes, it will help you if you can contain the errors, if you can connect the qubits. So if you can entangle them, because having a lot of qubits, but if you're Separately, not able. yes. Yeah, if they're separating, they don't. Yeah, no interact with each other, then it's not going to be very useful. So if you can get them to interact, if you can get the errors low, and if you can control the systems with a high degree of accuracy, then yes, it's going to help you because eventually by increasing the number and by keeping the control stable, I'm being a little sloppy here, but hopefully it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be able to enter the regime of, well, a regime where we can apply quantum error correction codes. And then having more qubits will allow us to encode a smaller number of logical qubits into a larger number of physical qubits with the idea of suppressing the errors even more. Exactly. And that yeah. will give us what are called fault-tolerant quantum computations. So quantum computations that are resistant to errors. And then the fun will really begin. I, I agree. Certainly a lot of potential gets unlocked uh, if we reach that point. Tommaso, this was uh, fantastic. I always enjoy seeing you and talking to you. I hope uh, also the audience felt the same way. Fantastic talk. Your uh, images were amazing. Even the one, um, the concluding slide with the kind of the planets on the dilution fridge <laughs> is such a great one. He's, um, a, he's, a, he's actually a, he's an artist from Singapore. He's super uh, good. So he helped us with that. Excellent. So thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure having you. And yeah, have a great rest of, of the day. Although I guess it's going to bed for you, probably. Yeah, it will be. But yeah. thank you so much, Juan Miguel. Um, and I wish everyone a lot of fun with the rest of the talks. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you.